Yeah, I want to see your I want to see your connection on that Louisiana purchase thing. That's big right there because I know I heard uh, Todd Street Bay talking about that they didn't have they couldn't ship us nowhere, so they had to create the prisons over here uh, to lock us up. Yeah, this plantation was uh, POW camps. Hmm. Hmm. They use everything that we already had over here. They're just making us think that it's from the 1800s or something like that. They did, they built it when they got here. But that's why we're going over to the castles on the land. Hey, I got to make a correction, too. We all, we hot on YouTube? Yeah, we, we hot right now. We hot. We hot and live. So while you're getting that together, uh, the last show we did, and I was talking about the Black Hawk Down incident and Muhammad Fahd ID. And I was saying he was from Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. But I was already at Black Hawk Down happened in the Sudan. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Fahd ID okay. was the Sudanese. And the Go sister ahead. was saying something in the comments, but I can't see the comments while we live. I can't, I gotta see after the fact. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, the wisdom is in the error, young elder. Mm -hmm. So it was a post that I was supposed to have been put up about the nine ether. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't done it. And uh, part of the nine ether philosophy from the uh, sacred parchment scroll of black supremacy and the holy pibby was um, that uh, Ethiopia stands for ether utopia. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Brother Rich calling me here. I had to catch him when I get off of here. Hey, Brother Rich wants you to go live, too. Everybody trying to get you on, man, because you, you, you're the hot phenomenon right now. You're the hottest, you're the hottest nigga in the game right now, man. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants you on live. So, uh, And then it's about to get ready to take back off again because it's starting to get, get cool off. So everybody's going to be on YouTube listening. There's going to be more people on YouTube now uh, doing the... Uh, the winter of solstice, you know what I'm saying? More people in the mm -hmm. house sitting and they just like trying to absorb information. So like, so we're finna get ready to take back off. We gave them a, we, we gave them a little break right there, but it's, it's about to get ready to take off now. All right, I got yeah. that on. I'm gonna switch to the laptop now and then we, we can take off. Hey y'all, we in the building, how prisons, uh, how castles turn into prison with the, the legendary brother Rod Hayes. Hit that like, hit that subscribe. We're going to be dropping this cash app in the links if you want to show him some love. He don't do it for the money, but if you want to show him some love because he's putting in this work for us, we're going to drop the cash app in the links and we're going to pin it in the messages. Let me switch to the laptop and then we're going to get the chat pulled up and we can take off. And I, and I got those videos you sent me. I got those already ready to go too. Those uh two videos. And I mm -hmm. found like two more too. Uh, let me go ahead and switch to the laptop real quick. So, oh, yeah. It's about to get greasy. We're going to lay the foundation of the Louisiana Pyramid. I mean, the Louisiana Purchase. Okay. And what was part of it in the Lewis and Clark Expedition. So, um, when you get ready to pull up the pictures, it's going to be the, uh, um, the one that got the Port of New Orleans. It got... Um, um, you got all that stuff already on it. A Port of New Orleans, the Louisiana Trail that they took, Lewis and Clark Trail that they took, and all that's in the same folder. Oh, yeah, it starts right here. Thank you for the story right here. No, I want to start with a map of the Louisiana. Okay, I got you. I got you. I got you then. <clears throat> I guess this one right here. Mm hmm. See if we blow it up for us, we can read it. I'm going to blow it up. You see where it say Louisiana in the green? Yep, right here. Acquired by US in 1803. All right. Louisiana Purchase was one of the largest real estate deals in history. The United States purchased the Louisiana Territory from France at a price of $15 million, or approximately $0.04 cents an acre, 
The Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the United States and opened up North America to westward expansion. You see this trail that they're showing in the red, right? That's the trail yeah. that um, Lewis and Clark traveled. Okay. Okay. Um, for the next thing, pull that up right there. Blow that up. Let's look at that logo since it's here. You see that say Port Nola, the port of New Orleans. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so what happened with the Louisiana Purchase is this is what they bought. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Now, I think I sent you an actual picture of the port. Okay. Let's see. Oh, yeah. You, you, oh, okay. Right. It's a Louisiana Purchase. I think I see a couple pictures over. The other way. You're going the wrong way. Oh, yeah, you're right. Go back, go back, go back. You just pass it. Keep going. This should be up in here. Okay, look what that say. This is a book about the Lewis and Clark expedition in the Louisiana Purchase. Uh huh. What made me get the book is blow the cover up some more. I blow it up. Look at the people in the picture. Yeah. All right, what you right here? Yeah, he's like a dog skin can of cat. She like a they, they they had a uh, they had uh B and Bay was a translator, but yeah. they called in the record and say they big they big buck negro. Yeah, big buck negro. And they never identify who he was, but we know who he was because Big B and Bay wrote about being on the Lewis and Clark expedition. And yeah. translate. Yeah. So go back another picture. Let's see what the next one back is. The other way. Yeah. So this is what we were supposed to be talking. These talking points. Uh-huh. Right. So you got to remember. They said that the Louisiana Purchase was one of the biggest land purchases, real estate deals in history, right? Uh-huh. But they only bought the port. They only bought the port. All uh right, -huh. go ahead. Get that head. Get a rock. Okay, now, the um, Louis the Purchase Agreement grants the protectorate right that the French had to secure the organic people against the invading hordes coming from the east, what we call them... Um, English, Dutch, French, Spanish, conquistadors, nobles, the black nobility, a.k.a. the goddamn white man. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. And the white man ain't white. No, nah, we know that. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Back here. <clears throat> okay, now, so we know that they purchased it, but we don't know about the protectorate agreement. Uh -huh. When they sold the port of New Orleans... They actually so, uh, sold the protectorate rights as well. They didn't sell the land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. I'm with you. Now, what Lois and Clark did was a land survey. Mm -hmm. This is why they traveled across to the Pacific Ocean. They knew where they was going because that was a major port town up in that area where they went. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the map and look at where they went again. Make sure you get that top northwestern corner right there. That's what we want to look at. We want to see what's over there. Where did they go? Say the four. Oh, uh, hold on. I got a better. It's a better one in here. Oh, it's a better one. It's right here. Not the Louisiana Purchase. No, I'll go back right here. All right. They went to Fort, Fort Chasta. Chop spot. I, I can't see it clear enough. Yeah, uh, but I can see the fort part. Yeah, it's a fort. I can't. I don't know if that's a T or L. It says fort chop stop pops, and the uh the uh Nez Perit Nez Percy uh tribe. I, I, I heard of that tribe. The Blackfoot it says Blackfoot Shoshone Nez Nez per, uh, Percy 
Fort Mandon. Is that's over here, right here? All these are showing the people they interacted with when they stopped where they met them at. Uh huh. These was already settled lands because everywhere they step in that, it's a tribal village. Uh huh. Right. That's why they know who is the Sioux, who is the Floyd. Right? Who is St. Charles? Well, who do they run into in St. Charles? All of these is the settlements. Uh-huh. All right. Now, the natural land barrier was the Appalachians on the east, which would have been in the area that's pink. Uh-huh. In the United States at the time, wasn't that big. It was only the original 13 colonies. Uh-huh. Right? Uh -huh. And the French was losing the war to the indigenous people. And they sold the protectorate agreement with the Port of New Orleans to the incoming legal fiction or bankers called the United States Court. Okay. All right. So from here, um, we need to know when they're looking at the land, what are they looking to see? Who live in the castle? Yeah, who live in the castle? So... A lot of people don't know there's castles on this land. So we're going to run them videos so they can see some of the castles. Okay. And then we're going to go over what they did with them. All right. I got you. You can watch much of each one of them as you want to. I think the longest one is like 10 minutes. Okay. Something right. like that. We got you. But I want them to see that it's, it's castles over here that's been here the whole time. Yeah, and who, who built these castles? Hey, who built the castles, uh, Brother Rod? Who's, who, been, who been here the whole time? We, we were. Exactly. Uh, so hey. you got to remember, they're doing the land survey. What is they surveying the land for? To steal it? Look, George Washington said, that when they came across the land, there was people that was rulers, but they didn't rule over nobody. Well, go ahead. Right? So they had yeah. to, somebody got to be the subject. Uh-huh. Right? Well, if you got a subject, you know you're going to need a predicate. Uh-huh. Right? Noun and a pronoun, an adjective and a verb, we're going to put the whole sentence structure out there. Uh-huh. Right. So the sentence is we was they was searching the land to see who was living in these elaborate places right here. This is real critical to understand. And this is why it's critical for us to go over um, these videos. See if you can make it full screen so I can really there get good, right good look. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Uh, using castles, your mind may automatically jump to Europe, and you'd be right. Luckily, though, Europe is not the only place that has these amazing pieces of history. And even in the much younger United States, we have our own fair share of castles that are well worth a visit. So let's plan our next road trip. From Italian-inspired architecture to massive estates, stay tuned to number one to find out which castle was moved all the way from across the pond. Did you hear him say which castle was moved? Yeah, that's that's deep. Hold on, let me run it back. The Amorosa. I missed it. From across the pond. Italian inspired architecture missed it. to massive estates. Stay tuned to number one to find out which castle was moved all the way from across the pond. That's crazy. Number 10, Castello di Amorosa. If you want the feel of an Italian wine farm in the beauty of the California landscape, then Castello di Amorosa is just the place for you. Italian-style architecture and fine Italian wines are all found just outside the town of St. Helena in the Napa Valley. Unlike most castles you may hear about or could be lucky enough to come across in your lifetime, this castle's construction began only in 1994 oh, yeah. and was the vision of a fourth-generation Italian winemaker and entrepreneur, Dario Satui, who spent much so of his say. life discovering medieval castles and wineries throughout Europe. 
He fell in love with 13th century Italian Tuscan style architecture and took 13 years to complete the construction. See where it says Tuscan style? That's more. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, bro. In on there. What you said? Where it says Tuscan style architecture? Yeah. The Tuscans is the Etruscans. The Etruscans yeah. is the Moors who settled Rome. Yeah, okay. We with you. Right? Uh -huh. And they saying that this was just built um, less than 80 years ago. Uh-huh. Right? Uh -huh. This 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 castle we're looking at was supposed to be built approximately 1944. Yeah. All right. Just keep that in mind, but keep looking because they're not going to tell you when some of them was made for a reason. Right. Go ahead. I'm going to play it. Today continues the it's tradition crazy, it started in 2007 and is primarily a wine farm, specializing in Italian wines and often hosts parties and weddings alike on its premises. Interestingly, despite its use as a wine farm, this modern example of a castle comes complete with a drop ridge and a dungeon, as well as a torture chamber to enhance the feeling that you are actually in a centuries old castle. There is no mention as to whether or not the dungeon and torture chambers are used on people who drink too much of their wine, though. So we suggest you proceed at your own risk. They cracking We're jokes now. Castle situated along. Would you say? I said they cracking jokes now. That's yeah, a dream up from joke. Sleep. On the St. Lawrence River near New York City, the Bull Castle. I think Birdman bought one of them castles on the on the island like that. There was like look. This one's in New York City. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Eyes among the spectacular Thousand Islands and construction of this property started back in the year 1900 by millionaire George Bolt. He wanted to build the castle as a tribute to his wife and stated that it would rival any European castle of the time. But unfortunately, Bolt's wife fell ill and passed away just months before the completion. Devastated, Bolt halted all construction and never visited the island again, leaving the incomplete castle behind as a monument to his wife. From there, the castle would stand empty for 73 years. But in 1977, the Thousand Islands Bridge Authority decided to begin its restoration. And at last, the castle was built up to what it was meant to be. Today, Pause. it's a popular tourist attraction. Hey, I wonder if that dude was a moor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Listen, Go ahead. pay attention to what they're saying. Is it more likely that he stopped construction or that the building's so old it was deteriorating? The building. Look so at old. it. The building's so old? Yeah, they say a building was the construction was started in 1900 and it stayed vacant for 70 something years. And then they went back and rehabbed it and finished the, building the castle. My question is, was they really rehabbing it um, from being incomplete or was they uh, working on the damage that was done over the years of being unoccupied through natural deterioration on a structure that oh, look at it. That's right. That's right. That's a bad, that's masonry right there. And that we know that they ain't had that skill. But keep keep going. Let's keep going. All right. And, and weddings are even regularly held on the island. This castle is a great example of the power of restoration. And even though it was only opened in the early 1980s, it's a great example of 20th century architecture mm. combined with rustic beauty. You see them say Coral power castle. of uh, restoration. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Restore, yeah, they they they, re, they just upgraded it and like fixed everything back up, but it's been yeah. around for a minute. Keep going. Located just outside of Miami, Florida, the Coral Castle is very special for two reasons. That's at least that it is not strictly a castle at all, and second, because the entire project was done by just one man. As we mentioned already, the Coral Castle is not really a and, and just that thing that Venerian dude, Lampskin, Lamp, what his name is? Yeah, R Richard Leeskin. Yeah. He, yeah, the Bible said he was a uh, trickle. Castle, but rather a collection of stones gathered in different shapes. Some of them do indeed resemble the shape of a house, complete with stone tables and chairs, while some of the others are just small piles of rocks that loosely resemble Stonehenge. Also, as we mentioned already, the entire place was built by just one man, a Mr. Edward Lee Scalman back in 1923. Interestingly, though, a lot of the construction here is shrouded in mystery due to Edward building it all by himself using nothing but ropes, pulleys, picks, and winches to move some very large stones. In all, the construction of the Coral Castle took 28 years for him to complete. 
Despite the name Coral, the castle was actually constructed entirely from limestone, and for decades it had a perfectly balanced stone gate that was so easy to open that even a child could open the door with just a slight push. Today, though, the formerly perfectly balanced door's hinge has finally rusted away. While it is still a great tourist attraction, and people often stop by to admire the marvel that is the Coral Castle, the door takes a bit more effort to open. Prime is Hey, that dude, uh, yeah, Baba said he was a venerian. That dude, uh, and, uh, and a man from Planet Ridge. More expensive than ever, but I just discovered a money saving alternative. Are you still using? Number seven, Bannerman Castle. Located just 60 miles up the Hudson River from New York, yeah, you know there is a castle which today is only a shell of its former glory. Known as the Bannerman Castle, construction started in the early 1900s when it was one of the most spectacular sites of the time. Built by a munitions merchant, Francis Bannerman, in an attempt to replicate the medieval fortress from which he was born, the castle was a success and served as his residence for many years until Bannerman died in 1918. But after the owner's death, the castle began to deteriorate. And to make things worse, a fire broke out in 1969, destroying most of the building in the process. Today, what remains of the castle still stands. It often holds various events on the island throughout the year. One thing is for certain, though. Despite the fire and the castle being left to the elements for so many years, it is still one of the most beautiful buildings in the U.S. and is a true example of European-style architecture in America. Number six, Biltmore Estates. As far as truly beautiful architecture goes, the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina is quite high on that list. Construction of the estate started in 1889 by George Vanderbilt, and after six years of building, the doors opened for the first time in 1895, despite the fact that the building was still under construction. During the time the estate was being built, Vanderbilt and his architect, Richard Morris Hunt, spent years traveling throughout Europe, purchasing all kinds of valuables to put in the castle. This varied from paintings right up to carpets and furniture. Architecturally speaking, they were also largely inspired by their travels throughout Europe, and they used many of the sites that they saw in the design of the castle, creating, in the end, an awe-inspiring French Renaissance chateau. Today, the castle is still under full operation and now even includes award-winning wines and tours of the vineyards. It also has its own bowling alley and its world-renowned 70-foot ceiling banquet hall. It doesn't matter if you are inside or outside of this building, the sights and the beauty of this castle is an amazing thing to behold. Number five, Font Hill Castle. This castle, Hill found Hill. in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, definitely has the look of- Hey, keep in mind, Pennsylvania is in America, man. So y'all, <laughs> Pennsylvania is in America. So this castle is in America. Uh, what they call in America, right? Your traditional Count Dracula style castle. Unfortunately though, or fortunately, depending on your tastes, this castle has a more down-to-earth story. Built between 1908 and 1912, the Font Hill Castle was the creation of Henry Champman Mercer, an archaeologist, anthropologist, ceramist, scholar, as well as antiquarian, who clearly couldn't decide on just one field to follow. Originally built as his private home and showplace for his collection of tiles and prints, he used this home as a base of operations during his lifetime. After he passed away, however, he wished for his massive multi-million dollar castle to be turned into a museum, with the caveat of allowing his own housekeeper to have living rights inside the castle, where she lived out the remainder of her days until 1975. Today, the castle still serves as a museum to both the life of Mercer as well as his collection of tiles, prints, Mercer. and pottery Mercer. while still Mercer. maintaining a strict preservation policy, wherein the castle be kept as much like its original it state as up. possible. <laughs> Despite this castle being an actual museum of ancient tiles, it still attracts over 30,000 visitors a year. This game, you're not ready for it. Number four, Thornwood Castle. The story of this castle is an interesting one because while it has only been in the U.S. for around 100 years, its origins actually began more than 500 years ago. Chester Thorne is the brain behind this castle with two ages. While in England in 1907, he bought a 400-year-old manor before deciding that, although he liked it, he would like it much better in the U.S. 
So good old Chester decided it was a good idea to have the entire building dismantled and then shipped brick by brick over to Washington State in the U.S. He then hired famed architect Kirtland Kelsey Cutter to painstakingly reassemble the entire manor. The construction of the castle took three years to complete, after which Thorne presented the Elizabethan-themed castle to his wife as a display of his love. These days, the castle is an inn, and its gothic, rustic charm attracts thousands of guests a year. In addition to lavish rooms and its antique interior, the estate has a private dock and lakeside beach, as well as a sunken garden, a beautiful landscape designed by the famous Olmsted brothers. As far as rustic charm and a beautiful countryside scenery goes, this castle is definitely something you need to experience in your lifetime. Number three, the Smithsonian Castle. Hey, keep in mind, it, keep in mind the Smithsonian Castle is where they, uh, they, I think they turned it into a museum and that's where they hide a lot of the artifacts about the, the land, Matt, the land over here, the people on the land, it's a lot of artifacts and the ones they couldn't get rid of, they took them and threw them in the lake, threw them in lakes and rivers and buried some of them in time, what they call in time castles, right? So keep that in mind. Smithsonian Institute. In Castle. Located on the opposite coast, this castle is the first of the Smithsonian buildings that were built throughout the United States, completed in 1855 and made out of what is now the iconic red sandstone. The building is today one of the most recognized in all of Washington, D.C. In fact, we are lucky to have the Smithsonian building today, and it is all thanks to one man that we have them. The project was started thanks to a donation from Frenchman James Smithson, who, despite donating the money for the construction of the building, had never set foot on American soil. Originally, the building was the home of Joseph Henry and his family, Joseph being the first secretary of the castle, and today, a statue of him stands outside the building. Although it started out as just the one building, more government buildings as well as museums were built around it over the years, molding it into the spectacle that we know of today. And as a tribute to James Smithson, his crypt can now be found near the north entrance of the building. Have you ever visited any of the Smithsonian buildings? Let us know below. While you're there, remember to subscribe to our channel and hit that like button. Number two, Castle Gold. Situated a few minutes from New York City, the land on which Castle Gould stands was first bought back in 1900 by Howard Gould, husband of the then famous actor.